podcast started with a conversation. Paul Wesley and myself were talking about how many fascinating people there are in Totnes, so we decided to invite some of those people to tell their stories. Each guest nominates a friend to interview. That friend then interviews one of their friends and so on. The interviewee becomes the interviewer, making links in our Totnes chain. This first chain is based on peace, activism and music and is five links long. This third episode is called Chairman of the Board and features Martin Goldschmidt. Martin is MD and founder of the indie record label Cooking Vinyl, which was created 33 years ago in a council flat in Stockwell and has now grown into one of the leading indie record labels in the country, with 11 groups under its name, including Fat Cat Records and the Music Royalty Group. Billy Bragg is on its books, as well as Passenger, Psychedelic Furs, The Water Boys and many other bands. Martin is also a founding member of AIM, Impala and WIN, and also co-founder of the Palestine Music Expo. He began life as an artist manager before the creation of Cooking Vinyl, and after student life of anti-nuclear activism, which earned him a nickname, Martin Che Goldschmidt. He is the choice of his cousin, Tony G, and his song is Call Mother, A Lonely Field by Jackie Levin. Like young Irishmen in English bars, a song of home betrays us. Call mother a lonely field. Call mother a lonely field. Like truthful glances we exchange, a song of home betrays us. Like letters written in despair, never to be opened. Come on, the lonely field. Come on, the lonely field. I took her picture.
So oh, uh, this is Martin Goldsmith and uh, you chose Jackie Levin Call Mother a Lonely Field. Uh, why did you choose that song, Martin? Jackie Levin's someone I worked with for, well, the whole of his solo career. He was an amazing person, incredible storyteller, beautiful voice and I, I love his songs and I love his philosophy on life. Um, He's a very special person. Um, he died just over 11 years ago, uh, and I did, I think, 18 albums with him. And uh, I was thinking about it a lot, but he, he means a lot to me. Over uh, He has over the years. Um, and also, we had a bit of success with him, but not a lot. Hardly anyone knows about him. Um, he's one of those artists that, really pays to delve into um, because so I just urge all the listeners to check out his music especially that song I mean it's, it's so beautiful it is a very beautiful song and I thought you know Danny Boy being at the beginning really set the context of of, of what the song's about and I, I really like the intro actually um, but Jackie Levin uh, you know when you say we yeah, you talking about the record label? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think so. Yes. Yeah, can't so, remember. Yeah. So the record label. Um, can you tell us a bit about the record label that you run? It's called Cooking Vinyl. Um, started it in 1986. Before then, I'd been running an even smaller record label called Forward Sounds International, and did um, I think three different projects um, that were uh, fantastic, no, four actually, uh, that were fantastic and then um, hooked up with Pete Lawrence and we did uh, Cooking Vinyl together. It it started off incredibly successfully. The second record we did was by an artist called Michelle Schott that uh, was the Texas Campfire Tapes that just went the equivalent of in those days, the equivalent of going viral today, it was just a massive success. Um, and uh, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. We totally messed up the finances. And within a couple of years, we decided to call it a day and we were going to stop. And uh, after a bit, I changed my mind and decided to keep going. But Peter decided to leave and I bought out his shares. And... Uh, we had loads of debts and I worked for about five years and repaid off all the debts and um, yeah, it's still going. It's here In today. Incredibly, incredibly. Um, and the campfire tapes, as I remember, had quite a story to them because they're not just called the campfire tapes by coincidence, are they? No, they were recorded uh, um, on a round a campfire in Texas um, on a Sony Walkman. Um, don't know if people remember what that was, <laughs> but that was when you recorded things on cassette. Uh, the quality was rubbish. The quality on this was even worse because the batteries were run down, so it was the wrong speed on the album. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. The record had crickets in the background and all the noises of the campfire, and it was a very special recording. And she was a very special artist, and. Uh, it captured something and it captured people's imagination and uh, yeah we, we ended up selling a large number <laughs> so 
you talked about um, you talked about starting this company in '86 and doing four projects before that. I should say at this point that Martin and I are cousins, and I've known Martin since he was born. So um, our history goes back way before he ran a record company. So let, let's track back a bit. And uh, before you, you've always been keen on uh, when you when you get keen on something and and, and uh, get your claws into it, you really stick with it. So I remember before anything with the music you were into chess weren't you i was and um been pl- started again since i've come down to totnes and joined totnes chess club and we've set it up formally and we've had our first two matches this week and um but no when i was uh, I-, I played fanatically till i was about 19 um and then got completely bored and stopped but i I was um, a Sydney junior champion. I lived in Australia for a bit and number two in the Australian junior championship and came fifth in the British junior championship and various other things. Um, And then just stopped, got bored, (laughs) moved on. And when you got bored and moved on, was that when you went to college, to university? Yeah, and... I mean, my dad died when I was 17. It was, uh, I don't know, I stopped playing chess at 19. I moved to college. I get, I, I moved on in terms of my interest from chess to, I got very involved in uh, political activism. And uh, I think I just, my head went into other places. I'm trying to, wanted to change the world. <laughs> don't we all? Uh, what sort of political activism did you get involved in? I have no idea how it started. Um, it's, I don't know. No, yeah, that's right. It started at Barnet College. I had this subversive sociology teacher who sort of started to prod me and get my curiosity going and it led to a slippery slope of getting more and more interested in politics. That's right. And then when I, when I um, went to college... Uh, I got really active at college and uh, when I went there the college was pretty sleepy. When I left it was one of the most uh, sort of politically active colleges in the UK and led to waves of student revolts and was quite legendary. <laughs> and which college was that? It was, uh, it's now South Wales University, it was Polytechnic of Wales <laughs> at that time. And uh, I got involved in everything. Um, I was I, in, I was involved in the Socialist Workers Party, which was a um, a far left group. And uh, at the time, it was the sort of I think it was their golden age, really, because it was at the time of the Anti Nazi League, which was an amazing thing to be involved in. And I remember setting up the local branch in the college, and we, um, you know, we were in Pontypridd, which is a tiny place in Wales. It's a bit like Totnes. It's <laughs> in not the, like, it's, is it? Pontypridd and Totnes. It's, it's size-wise. It, size-wise. It's, yeah. just, you know, both sort of small and out the way and, and, and interesting. Um, although there are a lot of differences. Any, anyway, so I organised, um, I think, 25 coaches up to the uh, Rock Against Racism marches and in London to the carnivals and stuff and uh, organised local events and, yeah, just got very involved in, in everything, really. Um, any campaign going, I was, I was involved in. I mean, the most exciting ones, the minor strikes were incredible down there because we had all the pits down there and got, you know, to know the local miners and um, was quite involved in all of that. But uh, it was every campaign going. But then, and then when you moved out of college, didn't you? Did you uh, carry on being political? Yeah, I kind of uh, moved into the whole issue of environmental politics and the anti-nuclear movement, which is, in those days, is the equivalent of what um, uh, XR is today. Um, it it was the big environmental issue of the time, and um, I set up. Uh, the student wing of the whole thing 
uh, when I was in Wales and uh, that was it became a national movement that was really exciting and then um, came up to London and got an office up here and it was uh, it was funny actually that's the first time I came to Totnes was uh, I was invited to give a talk uh, about um, the dangers of nuclear power in Dartington so that was the early 80s was the first time I came and I used to do talks all over the country and it was strange thinking back on it you know debating with nuclear scientists aged 22 not knowing <laughs> much <laughs> but, uh, it's never stopped you Martin <laughs> it hasn't <laughs> and uh, yeah no it was it, it's great when I mean the arguments we were saying then have you know really come home to roost the need for alternative energy the need for conservation um it's that the nuclear industry came out of weapons it's always been about centralized um and very inefficient economic forms of power that you know and and known to have the odd accident and that's kind of what we're banging on about that really the focus should be on alternative energy and conservation and um i think time has shown although there's a there's a big resurgence in interest in nuclear now as well so so, so did your kind of did your campaign with nuclear energy have anything to do with music did you have any kind of well after a bit i was at a crossroads of what do i do next after the student thing because i'd got someone else to run it and step down and decided to get involved in organizing all the music for um, the anti-nuclear movement and for campaign for dis nuclear disarmament and I um, started organising you know put together a, a group of people to do all of that and uh, did some big concerts in Trafalgar Square did, did tours up and down the country we're, we're getting groups to organise benefit concerts locally it was a kind of follow on from rock against racism in a way in environmental politics and using a lot of what we'd learned from rock against racism about you know using music as a force for communicating and connecting with people so so which bands got involved what were the what were the big the big groups that were the people who wanted to get involved um well there's some of the really big bands of the time like the the specials, the jam, the beat. It was interesting because one of the things we did was the first two UK tours of the Thompson Twins before they became a sort of pop band. And uh, what's even weirder is that I bumped into this guy in Totnes recently who actually I used to know really well when he managed them. <laughs> He's now known as a builder locally. But yeah, I remember when he was managing the Thompson Twins at the peak of their career and very successful. Yes, no, I, I remember um, being interviewed years and years ago in Totnes and um, by the television company, actually, and they they said uh, coming to Totnes was like visiting a place where a circus had visited and never left, you know, that there were, that were so many interesting people with so many interesting part, pasts. Um, so do you still work with any of the artists or did you continue to work with any of the artists when you started cooking vinyl yeah i did i i mean the, f f the second artist i worked with was rory mcleod and uh i worked with him on cooking vinyl for many years and interestingly i went to see him recently at ashburton which was lovely to reconnect with him again after all these years um, another one that I w worked with was uh, Poison Girls, and I organised some benefit gigs with them. They were uh, people probably don't. They were sort of at the forefront of the whole anarchist punk movement, um, and uh, they ended up asking me to manage them, uh, which was my kind of my first proper job in music, which was strange because I think I was about twenty six, and the lead singer was this. 46 year old very powerful punk woman and it's a bit like trying to manage your mum it was uh, <laughs> but you know um we stayed in touch till she died we got on really well she died a couple of years ago unfortunately um the uh there's two remaining members of the band who i'm both still in touch with you know in 
Uh, one of them still sends me Christmas cards, which is lovely. Uh, yeah, so it's um, there's there's quite a few bands from early on that I'm still in touch with. The Cowboys Junkies was one of the bands that we had big success with early on and uh, were just about to do another record with them so after all these years so yeah it's it's um there's been a lot of continuity but also a lot of people have you know moved on and done other things and it's not stayed with us so for how how have you managed to keep cooking vinyl going is it is it just working in britain or does it uh do you have bases in other countries now no we've got um we set up a, a few years ago an office in Australia that's done very, very, is very successful. Uh, we set up in America, that's been really hard, but that's doing, that's doing quite well. Um, and then we work with sort of, um, we've got people on the ground in France and Germany. So no, it's, it's quite, and then we've got um, partners all around the world. I mean, it's a worldwide setup. Uh, has your politics uh, and your activism informed how you've set up cooking vinyl at all? You me- mentioned Jackie Levin not being a hugely successful artist, or in commercially. I mean, he's hugely successful in lots of other ways, and you're quite right. People who delve into his works love him, uh, but you stuck with him for eighteen albums. I mean, uh, it might have been more. <laughs> <laughs> you lose count of yeah, I'm sure you do. But um yeah, it's it's one of in a way the luxury. You know, I didn't do it to get rich or to I didn't even plan to set up a record company at all. I was just this band who had these songs and I went round record companies to see who'd put them out and no one would and so I did and that was the first thing I put out and I never meant to be a record company and it, it was always about really trying to turn people on to music I loved. And I've always had a relationship with political music. So, you know, to have Billy Bragg on the label was um, quite a big milestone for us. And, and many of the other artists we work with, uh, you know, have really um, got incredible ideas and are really great communicators, amazing lyrics and stuff like that. I've always loved intelligent lyrics. And I think you know, it's meant that the label hasn't been as commercial as it could be. Uh, and it's been it's been hard, but we've we're still here. Is the label involved politically in any way or do you, are you involved politically in in any way still? Yeah, I I am. Uh the label isn't really, although there's a lot of empathy for the big issues that are around and we try to have uh quite aware policies on 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 um in terms of employment and diversity and things like that um but um as a sideline i got very involved in again by complete accident palestinian music and uh, yeah been very active in in the whole thing with Palestine. And what do you mean by accident? What was the accident? Did you fall over in a high street or something onto a Palestinian? Or what happened? No, I, there's an annual music business event called Medem, which is the biggest uh, get together was till it was stopped a couple of years ago in the music industry and I was doing a keynote and this guy came up to me afterwards and said you know hey I do a a showcase thing in in Israel would you like to come and I thought fantastic you know free flights free hotel beaches sounds great Um, and then after a bit I said to him yeah but if I am I'd love to you know hook up with some Palestinian musicians I was very naive about the situation. He said, well, I know one, and he introduced me, and I managed to persuade the guy to take me up to the West Bank to meet a load of other musicians, and uh, I was deeply, deeply moved by it. I, I ended up in the evening in, in the pub up, in a pub up there with someone on acoustic guitar and eight different rappers freestyling in Arabic <laughs> to me um, it was an incredible gig um, I you know went to a shisha bar before them 
before that with them and they were telling me their stories and it was really like nothing I'd ever heard before. And it's so different when it's people telling you their stories in their lives rather than you reading about it or hearing about it on the radio. It's very different when you're looking in someone's eyes and hearing what has happened to their brother or their mother or, you know, it's you know it's horrendous and I was deeply shocked and deeply moved by by what I saw and heard and also by the warmth of the people I met there I made made some really good friends there and I, I wanted to do something about it and we got talking with some of the musicians and said um, I'm going to a showcase event in Israel why don't we do something similar in Palestine and we set up um uh, and a sort of music showcase event for Palestinian music in the West Bank, which was actually incredibly difficult. It was it reminds me of um, the film Cool Runnings and the Jamaican bobsleigh team going to the Winter Olympics. It was very hard to set up that event in the West Bank, um, but it became very successful and it became the biggest music event in Palestine. And it also became legendary in the music industry uh, and people would really wanted to go to it because we only had a limited number of spaces you know but we've taken 150 professionals from the music industry to Palestine and it, with as exception they've all found it life-changing it's it's a very unique event um, and I've worked with the people organizing and become we've become kind of the um contemporary music part of the whole Palestinian scene so you know there's other people who uh, are the sort of go-to people for classical music or folk music or whatever but you know for anything contemporary it's um, the Palestinians I work with and me and a couple of people really in the U UK <laughs> it's uh, the alternative part of the Ministry of Culture. So, so what makes it so difficult to set things up there? <laughs> I know, I know, you know, like, I know, but... Oh, uh, well, I the never... uh, Israeli government aren't very sympathetic to freedom of anything Palestinian, really. Um, so freedom of movement's a big challenge. Um the government's got no money. Um, that means there's no government funding for anything. Um, people are frightened uh, to go there. Um, sometimes we think Gaza's been bombed, should we cancel? It seems a bit weird doing a music event after you know all these people have died. Um, sometimes we'll be organising to go somewhere and it'll be too tense because the night before Israeli soldiers have come in and you know shot someone on a in a refugee camp and you just it's not good to go there the next day um, you plan out all this stuff and then there's special checkpoints come and you can't go where you're going to go and your whole days are I mean it, it's, it's an occupied country and it's a, a conflict zone and the oldest conflict zone in the planet and it's very you know it, it's not like organizing something in Totnes. no it isn't at all and I, but I, and I, 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 I wonder if there's anything on the Palestinian side because the politics within Palestine are not simple either they're horrendous no it's uh, it's you know then there's lots of uh, issues with every you know political group and uh, the politics in Palestine are a nightmare to navigate. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it sounds... I know that you set up PMX, which is... What's it? What does that stand for? Palestine Music Expo. Yeah, and that, it's been great. Um, but there, it's not the only country you set stuff up in. I think there's there's another country that... You've, there, yeah, I got well, roped in to do a festival in the DMZ zone in South Korea as well. The that's DMZ. The, that's the demilitarised zone in between yeah. North and South Korea. So those are the two, 
music events I do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's I'm a not bit. sure what the next one should be, really. <laughs> yeah, Ukraine think, sounds interesting. Yeah, Ukraine would be great, yes. just uh, One it, of our bands played Ukraine about six weeks ago. Actually. All right. Crimea would be a good place. Um, yeah, well, it, I mean, you've done amazing things and it, it does make a difference to people. I, I mean, I know there's a very kind of there's a legendary story about Springsteen playing Berlin just before the kind of wall came down and having a massive effect and uh, the authorities letting him in by mistake and it it just kind of and it does and it energizes people the, the arts are incre incredibly important to people um so are there any other artists on your label who are really significant like that like like what? Well, like who who really make a political difference, or uh, I mean, or activists like Billy Bragg and yeah, there's loads in their own way. I mean, S Sam Lee is a really passionate collector of folk music, but very active environmentally. You know, he's um, he's probably in Egypt as we speak. <laughs> Cop twenty seven. He's yeah, he's incredible like that. Um, then you know we've just signed a Palestinian artist called Rasha Nahas, who's um, uh, a gay Muslim woman, which is quite something in you know to be. It's not easy at all um, in that world. I mean, Gogo Budello, the Ukrainian band, uh, flag wave you know waivers for what's happening there in a very big way, and have done amazing work. In the last you know year or so about that issue um and there's another artist who was recently called fantastic negrito who i you know well well worth checking out his his lyrics are incredible um very deeply moving but there's there's we've been going for many years there's a whole catalog of stuff that is you know, I mean, years and years ago, we worked with Tom Robinson. I remember hitching around the country to see him do gigs. I was, you know, he's another big idol of mine, and it yeah. was incredible. You know, um, working with him. There's so many. Yeah, no, I remember his uh, his single that was a big hit, "Sing Cause You're Glad to Be Gay." Yeah, oh, that was one, and. Uh, War Baby was the other. Oh, War <laughs> Baby was a great song. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So you you've you've been living in London for a long time, but recently you don't live in London anymore, do you? You're a Totnesian now. Uh, how have you found Totnes as a place to live? Um, it's I. When COVID hit, I didn't need to work in an office. I couldn't work in an office. And uh, I came down here and it's it's been fantastic. It's just a different, completely different lifestyle. Um, there's, I think because it's so much smaller, people know each other. There's far less alienation. There's far more uh, interaction between people, which is lovely. You know, it's... In London, if you walk down the street, you never know anyone. Here, wherever you go, someone always says hello, and or normally a few people, and it takes bloody ages to get where you're going. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, but that's lovely. It's yeah. really nice to feel part of somewhere rather than just another face in a crowd. Also, the countryside around here is beautiful. I mean, it, you know, you go on bike rides, and I just can't believe I'm here. It's seeing all you know going on a bike ride in such a beautiful place i'm used to sort of seeing building after building after building of you know rather than beautiful countryside it's it's really a breath of fresh air very nice um i i guess the next question the maybe my final question really is uh at, You've you've done so many things, and I know that you know. Like I know that your chess career actually was pretty kind of good, and you you worked with some pretty high profile players, and your your record company has uh, defied the odds really by keeping going. I know that it's had some pretty rocky moments, and it's uh, it's come through, and you've had some big hits. So uh, is it? If you if you could achieve or change or do something else in the future, 
Have you got anything you'd really like to do or you'd like to see happen? Yeah, lo- lo- lots of things um, that, that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like to do things rather than say, I'm going to do this. <laughs> yeah, right. You just, you just do it. You like yeah, to, you... And, and also I drift into things by mistake and yeah. find myself doing them rather than by plan as well i do go you know i mean it was it was like that coming to totness it was like that starting a label it was the whole palestinian thing that's been such a big thing in my life. complete accident you know? yeah. <laughs> well it's an unusual situation to find ourselves in after kind of 65 years of knowing you um because I've known Martin pretty much since he was born and I've avoided telling kind of the awful stories about our childhood or youth to- together, which uh, would make uh, good telling. Probably a good time to end the podcast. Time. Yeah, it <laughs> probably is a good time to end the podcast. Well, it gets but, really embarrassing. Yeah, no, we've shared a lot of life together. If, so. if people want to know those stories, they have to buy you a drink down the pub. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you very much, Martin. The next episode is called The Rock and Roll Hairdresser and features Christina Biganski. Christina Biganski.